Here's a leper that starts walking. He's about 300 feet away, and you can hear him yelling, Unclean! Unclean! Jesus could say, be cleansed, right there and then. But he doesn't do that. The leper gets to about 25 feet away. Jesus still says nothing. The disciples start backing away. The leper gets right up there. He gets on his knees in front of Jesus, and he says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And this is what I hadn't seen before. We assume Jesus touched him and healed him, but that's not what it says. It says he touched him, then he said, I'm willing, then he said, be clean, and then he was clean. He didn't have to touch him. When he said the words, be clean, he was clean. So it wasn't the touching that made him clean. So why did Jesus touch him? That verb, touch, means to grasp. It also means to hug. That leper came down and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus hugs him. He hugs him because God knows exactly what we need. This man hasn't been touched by another human being in years. And our Savior hugged him and then said, be clean. Joshua was running out of time, but Joshua was on the battlefield in the will of God. And he had the boldness to pray one of the boldest prayers in the whole Bible. When he looked at the sun and he saw that it was going down and that he needed more time to defeat his enemies, he said, oh sun, stand still. There's times when God has to stop something before he can start something. He's got to stop the things we've been doing so that he can start doing what he wants to do. Sometimes he's got to slow things down. Down, sometimes he's got to speed things up in your life. But he works. He's the God who halted the waters of the Red Sea and the Jordan. He halted the rains of the entire world. He halted the winds of the storm. He halts the sun, the moon, and the stars. He halts the armies in battle. He halts the heat of the fire in the furnace. He halts the mouths of lions, the flow of blood, the spread of leprosy, demons, and death. He even halted a donkey. He can halt whatever he needs to halt in your life so that he can start what he wants to start. He's more than willing to step in, but you have to be willing to pray a prayer of faith and boldness. When Naaman got to the side of the Jordan, I imagine he had on his armor, his military garb, everything that represented his accomplishments. So he's standing next to millions and millions of dollars. He leaves it on the side of the bank. He takes off accomplishment after accomplishment. He removes it all until he's naked and ashamed. And he goes into this dirty river, not once, not twice, but seven times. And the Bible says he came out healed with the flesh of a child. See, God didn't just heal him, he restored him. And he didn't give him the flesh of an old man who had been in battle. He gave him the flesh of a child. He restored him all the way back. So when he heals you, he restores you all the way. He doesn't just heal you a little bit so that you feel a little good. No, he, when he forgives you, he forgives you all the way. He came in with millions, but he left with dirt. But that dirt was more valuable than all the millions he had. And like Naaman, Jesus took off his royal garments, and put them aside, and took on the flesh of lowly man. And he became a child and grew in wisdom and in stature as the Lamb of God who would bring complete healing and forgiveness to the world. The pattern God set up in the creation account is one, two, one. Man was one, and then God took woman out of the man, they became two, and the two became one. God separated Adam from his rib, made a woman from the rib, and then united man with woman. One, two, one. God separates and then unites. Light and darkness were together, one. God separated light from darkness, two, and then together they became one day. The waters were together, and then God separated the waters, the waters above and the waters below, to make one world. To be holy means to be set apart. Come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. We are one with the world and when we're saved, we're set apart too and then we become one when we're united with God. Jesus said, make them one even as we are one. Not 12, not 8 billion, one. The lion is an animal that God himself describes some of his attributes by. And if God is going to associate himself with a lion, 
then I better learn about it. The lion is the king of its domain. It's not the tallest animal in the jungle, nor is it the largest, nor is it the most intelligent animal. Even though we know God is omniscient and holds all wisdom in himself, yet when the lion shows up, everyone runs away out of fear and respect. An army of sheep led by a lion will always defeat an army of lions led by a sheep. The elephant is larger, bigger, heavier, stronger, more intelligent, yet when the lion and the elephant come together, the elephant runs. Why? Attitude mindset. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. When taking on the spiritual forces of darkness, like our father, we need to take on the mindset of a lion. The five kings, when they saw the power of God, they fled and they hid in a cave. It was a shepherd's cave. Joshua comes along and he says, let's roll some large stones in front of that cave and let's put people there to guard it. After they finish beating the enemies of God, he says, let's roll that stone out of the way and bring those kings out of the cave. And Joshua killed them and he hung them on a tree, five trees, and then he took them down before evening and he put them back in the cave and he rolled a stone in front of the cave and those bones are still there to this day. But I know of another king who left his throne. He came from a shepherd's cave, but he didn't run or cower before his enemies. He stood tall as he hung on a tree. And when he died, just like those other kings, he was taken down from the tree before evening, placed in a cave, and a large stone was rolled in front of it. And they even put guards there to keep watch. But that stone couldn't stop him, and that cave couldn't keep him. And those guards couldn't halt him from walking out in victory. If you start going the wrong direction, he's a god that will chase you down. He's the good shepherd that seeks his sheep. He called out Abraham from from Ur, he sought Jacob from the hand of Laban. He turned Abraham from a pilgrim to a patriarch. He turned Jacob from a cheater to a champion. He pursued Moses at the burning bush and turned a fleeing fugitive into a freedom fighter. He chased down Elijah when he ran from Jezebel to Beersheba. He pursued David through Nathan after he fell with Bathsheba. Jesus pursued the Syrophoenician woman to heal her daughter 30 miles out of his way in Tyre in Sodom. Jesus pursued a demon-possessed man in a cemetery on the other side of a lake through a storm. He chased down Peter and restored him over lunch together. He chased down the widow at Nain, the woman at the well in Samaria. And guess what? At the end of the day, if you're his sheep, he'll chase you down. Jesus is the shepherd, but he's also the lamb. The shepherd laid down his life as the lamb. He is our good shepherd who became a lamb to be led into the wilderness to depend only on the father himself as an example to us who are the sheep of his pasture. The shepherd who became a lamb only to be arrested and falsely accused and beaten. The lamb who was silent before his shears as they bound him and took him away and delivered him to Pilate. The creator became the creature. The shepherd became the sheep. The Lord became the lamb. The deliverer was delivered to his slaughterers. And the lamb of God took upon himself the sin of the world. Elisha is mocked by some boys for being bald. He then curses them in the name of the Lord. And then some bears come out and maul 42 of the boys. What the heck is going on? This story is about the denial of Elisha as a true prophet of Yahweh. Even though Elisha just inherited a double portion from Elijah, it happened in Bethel, which is an extremely significant place in the Bible. Look more into it. It's the place where Abram, or Abraham, first pitched his tent, built an altar, and called upon the name of the Lord. It's the place where Jacob's dream of a ladder to heaven took place. And when Jacob awoke, he said, how awesome is this place? Bethel means house of God. But 42 boys are mauled by a bear? What is going on? The Hebrew term that we translate as boys literally just means an unmarried male who has not become the head of his household. For example, the same term is used to describe David when he defeated Goliath. David wasn't a little boy or a toddler, so most likely this applies to these young unmarried men. Being called a baldy was in direct contrast to Elijah who was described as a hairy 
angry man. It challenged Elisha's authority given by God. The two bears is related to the two curses, because they cried out, Baldy, Baldy. The curse correlates with the punishment. 42 is also a number that's specifically related to blessings and curses, and in this case, it's the latter. Psalm 24, who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. That verse means nothing to you if you don't know what glory is. That word glory in Hebrew is kavod, and it means weight. That's all it means, is weight. And you know why that's important? Because when you go to the market to purchase something, and whatever it is that you're purchasing, you put it on a scale, whether it's salt or gold or silver, and the more weight that that had, the more worth that that had. Glory means worth. So let me ask you something. Are you glorifying God in your heart? Is he worth your time? Is he worth your sacrifice? Is he worth your obedience? Is he worth your love? Is he worth it to you? Does God have a lot of glory in your life? 